Um, everyone, we're gonna we're gonna get started today. Um, uh, I just want to give an overview of the program since uh, we have two uh, judges and guests here uh, joining us who have uh, graciously agreed to give us some feedback on your presentations. Uh, so over last uh, uh, 15 uh, sessions or so in last three weeks, uh, what we've sort of covered is a very uh, basic introduction to cybersecurity. Uh, we're calling this cohort as Cyber Aggies. Uh, we have a little Cyber Aggies uh, logo. And at the end of the course, uh, everyone um, who is uh, participated in the program and done at least 80% of the homework and activities uh, will get a certificate, uh, which they can use on their uh, resumes. Uh, we started the program uh, by, you know, just doing a warm up to cybersecurity uh, by, you know, looking at some of like popular and news articles and movies on cybersecurity. Uh, uh, two, next two classes, we worked uh, hands on on cryptography and steganography. Um, if you guys remember. Uh, and then we covered a little bit of public private cryptography and logic operators uh, uh, in the June 24th class. Uh, then we sort of switched gears a little bit and talked about fraud and phishing and how it affects uh, each uh, student as well as uh, an, an individual as well as companies. On June uh, 28th, uh, then we kind of uh, dwell a little bit into how you can use uh, search engines like Shodan and Google. And specifically, we spend a lot of time on Shodan and, and in this class uh, because it's very applicable for Internet of Things. And specifically, like, you know, as they kind of look into specializing in IoT cybersecurity or anything like that. Uh, you can see a lot of holes uh, through through some sort of smartly crafted queries. Each of the uh, classes has is very interactive, and the students uh, use um, uh, this uh, tool called Discord. And so, uh, uh, what what the students did was they posted their uh, OSINT uh, queries in this channel. So you can still see some students are catching up to the homework. Uh, so they uh, they kind of tried out a lot of queries and we kind of spent a fair bit of time in the class to learn about that. Uh, the next class, we did the same with Google. Um, uh, and then uh, 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 on June 30th class, we spent a lot of time on cybersecurity ethics, uh, which is very important. And we covered uh, a, a relevant curriculum of uh, this uh, program from cyber um, from Air Force um, uh, uh, called Cyber Patriots, and um, uh, we we did about three or four scenarios of ethics and had everyone kind of uh, participate in the debate on whether it's right or wrong and what makes cybersecurity. Uh, uh, what are the guardrails of cybersecurity? But overall, in short, we all kind of know do not do any harm. Uh, that's that's the key of cybersecurity ethics. Um, and then there is homework, uh, uh, which was assigned for the break. And then what the students did, uh, as we kind of have learned over time, uh, was um, they they wrote. Um, uh, analysis of a cybersecurity incident. And then uh, we have a Discord channel called Security Incidents and the students post their analysis of cybersecurity incidents in this channel. So we've got like really good uh, analysis and you will see in some of presentations today, some students chose that to be, um, uh, to be their project. Uh, we started on the projects uh, and and uh, and kind of detailed security incident discussion in the next class. We did a little bit more of ethics, and then uh, we we switched gears a little bit and did introduction to uh, networks and how internet works. Um, and students were encouraged to do like a, a network quiz. Um, 
and so the quiz was homework uh, for them. Um, the next class we we spent our time on careers in cybersecurity and each of the students kind of picked up like what career they would like and they posted on Discord about like what career path they would like to do. Uh, so I think um, we have we have a whole range of students from be, being like a cyber uh, uh, co computer forensics to uh, cyber security analyst to cyber security consultant to incident responders uh, and then uh, Nemon is uh, wants to be an IT auditor. Um, sweet. Uh, uh, we then spent some time on physical security, which is like how to secure uh, um, physical infrastructure. Uh, and we did some quizzing uh, and videos and watched some videos uh, from uh, uh, this uh, cybersecurity course test out. Um, and then the last class, we uh, dwelled a little bit on forensics. Uh, so, you know, how do you collect data uh, in cyber crimes? Uh, and then we, we learned a little bit about security engineering and how do you analyze the data, both from the forensics as well as uh, just the, the logs which you get for, uh, for access. So that's a very broad range of cybersecurity we covered so far. Um, the students have done excellent projects. They've kind of come up with something they want to talk about. Um, we have a wide range of projects uh, in this class. Uh, I think um, today we're going to see presentations. Uh, let me pull up Discord. Uh, today we're going to see presentations uh, from um, uh, Greg. Camille, Sania, CJ, Mide, Kiera, Jacoby, and Namoniza. So that's about eight presentations. Uh, is everyone on um, on today? Is do, are we missing anyone? I uh, just want to make sure. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So first up is going to be. Uh, Greg, uh, and then uh, uh, I'm going to introduce and uh, Greg, if you are ready, um, you can, uh, okay, great, uh, there it is. So Greg, if you are, I'm going to pin this. So if you are ready, uh, just say that in Discord. Um, I'm going to introduce your topic. Uh, so Greg's going to talk about ways to protect your online uh, sources. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, he loves to listen to music. I'm going to give a little bit of introduction from what he told us. Um, he loves to listen to music, read, uh, participate in competitive sports. Um, his computer experience, he's uh, familiar with um, basics of computers and using it for academic thing, but doesn't, uh, but doesn't know command line or has not like done any advanced programming. Uh, so with that, uh, when, if you're ready, Greg, I'm going to stop sharing and have you share. All right. So just so, uh, Greg, are you ready? Let me see. Yes. So uh, share your screen and unmute yourself. And okay. So the way to share your screen is you will see the share screen button. Okay, there we go. Perfect. We see your screen. Um, all right. Okay. There we go. All right. Awesome. Can y'all see that? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Gregory Jones, and I'm an incoming freshman at NCAT. Today, I will be making a presentation over 
um, one thing that excites me about cybersecurity, which is uh, learning ways to protect your online devices or sources. Um, so let's get started. These are the criteria I'll be covering for today to uh, give my presentation a little bit of flow to have, um, to give a main like theme I'm trying to say. So let's start off by talking about how um, cybersecurity has advanced over time. So in the 1940s, um, the first digital computer was created and online data and network wasn't really like a thing or it never existed. There was no type of interconnection between networks and online data. Um, in the 1950s, um, something called phone freaking began. And phone freaking is when people had a really large interest in seeing how to work a mobile device. And that interest is what led to them finding ways to make calls at no cost. So that way they could call people for free and also reducing tolls for whenever they wanted to call someone from long distance. In the 1990s, this is where a whole bunch of various viruses began to grow. Um, also hacker, hacker groups began to grow and uh, major companies began to face challenges um, in order to improve their security. Um, there was a, a specific virus called the polymorphic virus, which um, helps um, it stop computer devices from uh, detecting the virus. Some important techniques to look out for would be techniques such as phishing and fraud. Phishing is like a company or a fake company sending false advertisements and emails. Um, fraud is inducing others to part with something of value to give up a legal right. So it's like somebody is trying to like influence you to team up with something that is that they think would be of value so that way you could give up your own legal right. Um, these are the two techniques that will be used against uh, used against you for other people to try and get to your online mobile device or data. The most preventative thing to do would be to seek out for some kind of verification. This could be done through research or by simply just asking. Um, Another thing I would say is always give your sources some type of perimeter security. By perimeter security, I mean like um, having something else. Like if they get into your mobile device, they have to first go through a password. And if they get the password, then they have to go through a two-step authentication. So it's just having different layers of protection. So that way they can't just easily access all of your data on your mobile device. So I have like a, a ethics story. So there was a 16 year old kid named Jalen. Um, one day he gets a random email stating that his online information has been exposed to this organization called Aggie Hacker. The email then states that if Jalen doesn't pay them money and give his money information, his online data or his mobile device will be hacked. Jalen impulsively sneaks to get his mother's phone his mother, Naomi, never gave him permission, nor does she know about Jalen's email. He proceeds to give them his mother's financial info to protect himself thinking things will be okay, only for his mother to find out that her money was taken by the Aggie hackers. Naomi ends up getting her money back and she tells her son Jalen to set up a two-step authentication, two authentication factor to better secure the mobile devices after she had told Jalen about her own situation. And the question is, was Jalen ethically wrong or right? So some solutions he could have done to prevent all of this would be to, well, first of all, he was ethically, ethically wrong because his mother never gave him permission. But some of the things he could have done um, to prevent all this in the first place and protect him and his mother would have simply been to communicate with his mother when he first got the email and proceed to better take further steps in securing the devices. And he also could have asked them for some type of verification um, just so he could see like if what they stated was true or not. So like, 
I feel like another key factor besides like just giving your online data protection, another key factor when it comes to protecting your online sources would be communication, communication. If you ever get into any situation where it seems all for odd, you could try asking general human questions and see if like you get a robotic response or you could communicate with other people in your area and communicate with them and see like if you need to take any further steps or if it's just like a spam. I think communication is an important factor when when it comes to protecting your online sources. That's all I have for today. Oh, that's that's great job. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, maybe Thank we have you. a minute for uh, a question or two. Uh, if um, uh, if anyone has a question for Greg, uh, uh, Dr. Monty or Kate, feel free to ask a question as well. I was curious where the ethics story came from. It was just something I wanted to be creative and made up on my own, just to okay. prove a main point. Okay, great. Thanks. Awesome. All right, all right. this is Kate. Uh, one, first of all, I, I thought your organization was good. Um, you laid out exactly how you were going to present, and then you presented. Um, so you met the expectations that we were looking for. Uh, I did have one question or suggestion. When you had the ideas of ask questions or do some verifications, maybe um, we could define like, what are those? Who do you ask? What are the questions that should be asked? Or what are you looking for? For example, in a phishing thing, um, the link that's in the body of an email, when you hover over it, do you look at the bottom of your email to see if that's really the email link it goes to. Um, so I was just curious as to what are the questions that you had in mind or, or who are the people they should ask um, that people should generally ask. So that would be my question. But good job. Um, thank you. Um, when it comes to being in those situations, you could send a direct message asking the company themselves or you People, I would more so ask if you don't want to respond to the email, it would just be simply family members, or maybe if you know somebody who's really technology smart, you can ask them too. Thank you. Good job. Awesome. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you. You can. Um, awesome. Great. Next up is Camille. Um, are you ready? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to quickly introduce your topic. So Camille's going to, and you can start sharing your screen, Camille. So Camille's going to um, uh, uh, talk about Aggie Life, a cybersecurity game. Um, she, uh, uh, she, uh, she loves reading fantasy or manga. Uh, she, uh, she's new to computers. Uh, so everything you're seeing is something kind of uh, coming out. Uh, of her uh, um, of her new learnings. Uh, so um, take it away, Camille. Awesome. Can't hear you. All right. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Here, let me start over. Okay. So the topic that I chose is a cybersecurity game called Aggie Life. And the contents that I'm going to uh, go over is my personal feedback um, and my classmates, which are Kiera, Greg, and Maya. And I'm going to cover the core systems of the game what the game is about, the creators, and my final thoughts. So my personal feedback on the game is that Aggie Life is a fun game that teaches you about cybersecurity in a fun way. It's a game that's very easy and doesn't take that long to play. I like that you're rewarded with money when you answer a question right, and I learned a lot about cybersecurity with just a quick playthrough of the game. What Kiera thought was that she loved Aggie Life. Um, she thought it was very informative and it taught her a lot about 
cybersecurity that she didn't know before. And she thinks it's a great game for those who want to learn more about cybersecurity. What Greg thought is that he loved that you could gain money for answering your questions right. It's very easy to play and to catch on to quickly. And the game taught him some things about cybersecurity. What Naya thought was that it's a great introduction to cybersecurity and it taught her better ways to protect herself. However, after she played the game once, she couldn't find a way to play again. And it only gave her the option of resuming her previous game when asked, um, she finished. If I had not been taking this class, I would have liked to view my results to take note of what I uh, got incorrect for future protection. And therefore it's a good game for the purpose of only playing it on um, one time. In any game design, there is a core system and you have to start off with the core. And in Aggie Life, the core of the game is to test your cyber smarts. And equally important to the core are the features. And the features are directly linked to the core. The features of Aggie Life are gaining money when you answer a question correctly, learning more about cybersecurity and testing your knowledge on the topic. Um, what the game is about. In any game design, you have to start off with the core. Uh, and it's to test your cyber smarts. Well, it looks like I copied and pasted them. Well, what the game is about is it's a board game that asks you questions about cybersecurity. And once you get a game or a question correct, you gain money and it's basically just like a board game at the end and you see how much you've made. The creators of the game is the Division of Information Technology at Texas A&M University. They are a division that provides reliable and accessible IT services geared towards enhancing Texas A&M. My final thoughts about the game is that it's a short but fun game that tests your knowledge on cybersecurity. The game also comes with its flaws though. Like I said previously, um, you can only play the game once, which is very inconvenient, especially if we want to play the game, game again and test what you've learned. Overall, I think the Aggie Life is a game that is effective enough to get people to excited to learn about cybersecurity. That's awesome. Uh, great job, Camille. Um, any questions from anyone? And then Dr. Monty and uh, Kate. This is Kate. I would uh, be interested in knowing what what did you learn about cybersecurity after playing the game that you did not know before playing the game? Um, one of the questions that I didn't even know about was that it asked a scenario if you were like gonna purchase something and it's, it asked if you were supposed to use your credit card or your debit card. And I, my thinking was that you would probably wanna use your debit cards since it's your own money. But actually they said that you're supposed to use your credit card because you have a, you know, a credit card limit and it's easier to get your money back if something was to happen. Yeah, that, that's good information to know. Um, one, I liked your graphics a lot. Um, I thought uh, it was very well designed. I liked the fact that you got some feedback from some of your fellow students that did that. So I thought that was really good. Would have been nice to have seen maybe a screenshot of the actual game um, to show the example, but overall, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Camille, that was very good. Um, both presentations so far have been excellent. Can't wait for the rest. Awesome, great. Uh, so thank you so much, Camille. We'll, we'll move on to the next one. Um, uh, Sunny, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to share. And I will pull up. Uh, so, so Sunny is talking about the infinite possibilities of coding. Um, uh, and how they make life easier. Uh, she is uh, I don't have her hobbies and computer experience. Uh, so Sania, you should you should give a little bit of a little bit to us about what your hobbies and computer experience are like to start with. Uh, so 
take it away, Sania. Introduce yourself and the topic, uh, and maybe one or two hobbies you have. Um, um, so, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Sanaya Reese, um, and I'm an incoming freshman at ANT. Um, I'll be presenting about the possibilities of coding and how they make life easier. Um, and a little bit about myself, I play alto saxophone. Um, I've been playing it since sixth grade, so for about seven years now, and I plan on marching in our university's marching band, so I'm pretty excited about that. And I also love to draw and paint. Um, I painted quite a few pieces um, over, my, over the years, um, and so I'm looking forward to painting a little bit more so that I could decorate my dorm room. Um, so yeah, so without further ado, Okay, so our agenda will what is consist of the basics of coding, how coding can make life easier, what coding can be used for, and how you can get into coding. So here are the basics of coding. Um, so the base definition of coding is the process of transforming different ideas, instructions, and solutions into a language that an electronic device system can understand. Um, there are several types of coding languages, but the main ones that beginners stick to are JavaScript, Java, C, and Python. Um, and I will discuss those in a later slide. Um, so some of the main concepts that are important to know when you first start coding are variables, which are, if you really think about it, it's like a container and it's meant to hold information that you do code or you plug into your data system. Data structures, they allow for a large amount of data to be involved without duplication. Um, control, control structures analyze variables and make decisions of where to go based on the given parameters. So basically, um, the developer, they give parameters when coding, and so the control, the control structure determines what direction to go based off of those parameters. Syntax is a set of rules that define particular layouts of letters and symbols, and tools are pieces of software that helps programmers to develop code more efficiently. So how can coding make life easier? So if you think about it, every digital device that you're using involves some sort of code. From your laptop um, or tablet, simply operating from your laptop or tablet, simply operating to Zoom that we're on right now. They all involve innumerable amounts of code um, designed to make your life a little bit easier. So coding can turn simple instructions into various websites applica and application programs. It makes up our entire digital world. Um, Almost uh, everything can be done digitally nowadays, which often makes the quality of life for people much easier. As we're switching to a, we're progressively switching to a completely digital society, coding is extremely important because it acts as the instructions of various operating systems. Um, with the progressive switch, people have more time to focus on family, hobbies, and simple day-to-day -day tasks because they can pretty much ask, access anything by a simple search, and that's due to the beautiful intricacy of coding. So what can coding be used for? You can create various solutions to many of the world's reoccurring problems. Um, so if you think um, there is some, there's an there's an inaccessibility um, to a certain day-to-day -day task and you feel like it could be easier um, to do remotely, then you can use coding to create a website or an application um, that could run so that people could access it um, a lot easier than having to go in person or things of that nature. Um, so like I said in um, the previous slides, the main ones, the main programming languages that beginners use are C, Python, JavaScript, and Java. So C is used for developing software, um, software operating systems and databases. Python is used for building websites, software programs, and performing data analysis. JavaScript is used for creating web pages and front end and back end development. And what those are is front end development is the development of a graphical user user interface so that users can view and interact with that website. So if you've ever been on any sort of website, you know how you can interact with it. You can, um, if you're on an organization's website, you can press the contact us button um, and it'll basically give you all the information. So interactions like that. Um, Backend development is basically what's behind the scenes, um, the code that allows a database to run so that the front end can interact with the website. Um, and Java is a widely used object-oriented programming language that can be run anywhere without worrying about the underlying computer software. 
So how can you get into coding? So you can use various beginner websites such as Scratch, Python, Codecademy, and Google Coding. Me personally, I've used Scratch. Um, I was in a girls coding co club in middle school and we mainly use Scratch. I think it's um, a good website for beginners because it really breaks down everything um, to basically an elementary level. So when you're new to coding, it, it really does, it's really helpful because you get a, a better grasp over it if you were to use a more um, advanced website such as Python. So I think Scratch is a good website to start off with, but if you would like to start off with um, another website, I provided those as well. Um, so my summary, there are many things for coding and one could be right under your nose. It's like learning a new language, but just for your computer. And it has many contributions to, to today's society and many people are needed to work in its designated field. Any questions? Great, Sonia. Um, Thank you, Sonia. The are you related to the other Reese in the class? They're not related. Uh, <laughs> the same, no. same last names. You um, probably get that question a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's great. Great uh, links to especially to places like Scratch at MIT. I, I went to college there, so um, good place to go. The um, the motivation for coding was really good. I think that's um an excellent piece of this presentation I, before all of you were born i worked for motorola in the 90s and uh, we we estimated that the value of the cell phone back in the 90s was 90 percent software and 10 percent for the hardware so you know all the and i think that's true today maybe even a higher percentage is software related because everything is really based on that the, the chips are free and the hardware is free essentially um, but yeah, great, great presentation. Like it a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo that. I thought it was very well organized. I liked your uh, personal reflection as to which training system that you like to use. Uh, you seem like you've done some research. Curious, have you done any training in any specific language? Um, and if more than one, do you have a preference? Um, so I have not done any training in any language because the coding club that I was in, we more so focused on basics. We didn't really delve into any specific languages, but I do know that I want to get into it a lot more throughout college because I know how the field is in high demand. So it could be an excellent source of income um, if, you know, something were to happen. So I definitely do want to get into a language. I think I would probably start off with JavaScript. Yeah, it's probably one of the easier ones. Um, an interesting test in the future, if you ever want to, is you look at all of them, there's a standard like intro programming. It's sort of like hello world and how you program just for it to say hello world in all those different languages, which would be a really interesting graphic if you were ever doing anything um, in addition showing the differences between the languages. So but great job. Thank you. I would add one more thing. You know, the coding is gonna be part of everybody's life. I think everybody, um, in this class and going through a and is going to have to have to know some amount of coding in their job or their future career. Um, it, it's a requirement. The cybersecurity industry is growing dramatically. I don't think you can go anywhere without dealing with cybersecurity. Everybody gets fished all the time. We all have to respond to these crazy emails and text messages we get. Um, so yeah, good job, and I hope everybody has a gets a little bit of experience with coding as they go through A and T in the next four years. So that that's a great point, both like you know on on kind of including including the the comparative analysis of languages as well as you know trying to learn coding. Uh, Scratch is a great place to start. Um, as I kind of pointed out to the class, we also have a Python for cybersecurity course, uh, but um, this is something which you kind of ease into uh, because a lot of times it, it gets students uh, uncomfortable and then they end up giving up computer science or cyber security. Uh, I also want to make a plug yeah. too. Since you're NCAT students, uh, there is a resource tool called LinkedIn Learning that will be accessible to you as you come in. Um, and they do have these programming courses on there. I mean, they're mostly YouTube, so it's not interactive, but they also give some nice overviews on things as well. That's right, yes. 
Awesome. Thank you. So next up is CJ. CJ, whenever you're ready, start sharing your screen. Um, she's, uh, uh, CJ is going to talk about computer hacking through the 2000s. So a little bit of history of, you know, computer hacking. Uh, he, um, he loves to play basketball, uh, watch TV. Uh, his favorite show is All American uh, and uh, spends time with his friends. Uh, he's new to computers. Uh, so all this is something which kind of piqued his interest during the class. Uh, so go ahead, CJ. Is CJ on? Awesome. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. All right, there you go. Okay, great. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, my presentation: computer hacking through the two thousands. Agenda for today is to explain the history and evolution of computer hacking from the two thousand to twenty twenty two. The start of hacking. One of the earlier hackers, John Dapper, Captain Crunch, is a former U.S. Air Force electronics technician. He's part of an underground culture of uh, phone freaks, which they do is bypass telephone systems to uh, get free phone calling. Um, what he did was he used a Captain Crunch toy whistle and what he did was blow through the, through the uh, toy whistle to, um, to get a certain type of pitch to bypass the telephone system, which is how he got the name Captain Crunch. Going on to the 2000s to 2010, um, there was an increase of malicious hackers, new and dangerous types of hacks they used to get into government entities and prominent businesses such as Microsoft, eBay, Yahoo, and Amazon. Um, one of the hackers that did it was, his name was Michael uh, Kelsey. He was a young 15 year old. Um, he used DDoS to um, overwhelm the servers and cause websites to uh, crash. Um, the reason why he wanted to do this so he can um, impress his um, hacker community and um, things he did was um, government had to uh, create legislations and laws to uh, stop this type of hacking. Going on to 2010 to 2022, the hacking community has become more sophisticated, complicated, and complex. Launching rats, ransomware and Wi-Fi attacks, they use highly classified documents and expose government secrets. So to stop this, uh, they created upgraded systems and improved technology to stop these hacks. Going on to now 2020 to 2022, um, hackers are now using data breaches, network, infiltrations, bulk data theft and sale, identity deaths, theft, ransomware outbreaks. Um, now hackers they're really trying to do is um, get your information and just sell it online. Um, as you can see, there's around 2,200 cyber attacks per day. The summary of my um, presentation, like you, as you can see, um, we started with Captain Crunch um, getting to telephones to um, hackers now um, getting your information and trying to sell it. And you see hackers are getting smarter and different and using different ways to um, hack information. And um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Great job, CJ. Um, I would encourage you to read the book. Uh, this is how the world uh, will end. I'll, I'll, I'll share a link in resources. Uh, that's a great um, summary of cybersecurity history as well. Um, uh, Dr. Monty, Kate, any questions? Um, yeah, I would uh, like to hear some more about like the impact of the hacking. I and mean, we, it's a really good summary of all the different types of hacking that's going on, but I'm wondering, you know, what the impact has been to companies, to their finances, loss of money, you know, things like that. It'd be interesting to hear more about in the future. What I know is that um, they had to increase their technology and use different ways to stop the hacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to that point where um, that could be demonstrated is by specific examples of a specific hack. Um, you know, I ran somewhere from like say one of the hospitals that had a ransomware attack. You could have that example, um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on where that happened, but you know, what was the impact of people not being able to access the patient data by surgeries being put on hold? Um, that would have been a great example that would also 
illustrate sort of also not just the economic impact, but a personal impact as well, right? So that would be a great example to use in a presentation like this. Um, I love the story about Captain Crunch. Uh, to be honest, I had totally forgotten about him. That's been like forever <laughs> since I had originally heard that story. So thank you for, for bringing that back. The other thing I would have liked to have seen just a little bit more details of what the denial of service means, what a ransomware actually means, uh, sort of the background detail on that. Uh, but you had things laid out well, you had the timelines laid out well, so, so good job. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, CJ. So next up is uh, Mide or Ayomide. Um, and as you kind of share. Great. Yeah, so uh, stepping into the shoes of a cybersecurity architect at Microsoft, that's great. Um, introduce yourself, any hobbies, and, and take it away. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ayamide Abadou, and I am a bioengineering major at NCAP. I play trumpet, baritone, clarinet, flute. So I've been playing since I was in the fourth grade, so it's been a long while. I do jazz band. And I do mostly like classical music, but I took a break from that. Um, I play lacrosse, field hockey, and I love to play tennis for fun with my friends. And I really enjoy student government led organizations like SGA. Like this past year, I was my school's um, student government president. So I really do enjoy that. And I love, absolutely love to um i love science so it's always been a big passion of what i want to do so this was the perfect major to fit that so the title of mine is stepping into the shoes of a cybersecurity architect at microsoft her name is Venicia, and also looking at, into how cybersecurity contributes to other industries So the person's life that we're looking into is, Ven is Venicia. She is a mom and she also works and she's a cybersecurity analyst at Microsoft. So this is like a day to day of her life and what she do does every day. She starts her, her work day waking up at 4 a.m. She drops her kids off at school. She listens to podcasts to update her on any cybersecurity news. She starts her work by checking out her emails reading any security product and architecture updates. She also does some documentation in response to any internal customer queries. At 10 a.m., she gets she starts getting some customer meetings to help customers with architectural guidance security and practice and practice recommendations and any advanced technical assistance. After that, she does some K, KQL queries for her lab that she's building in Azure and its sim environment. After lunch, she wraps up any further admin tasks and heads out. So her tips for people who want to go into cybersecurity is start with doing lots of research, start with some free courses and any introduction to cybersecurity and cyber queries. Choose a focused domain early because it helps you to focus your energy and your studies to become a specialist rather than generalizing into an introductory of everything. She also mentions reviewing the list of NICE framework, which is a framework that provided guidance for roles and role requirements in cybersecurity, and to choose something that you're passionate about and something that you're good at. So some of the challenges that she mentions that cybersecurity professionals face is that the employer job profiles are still outdated and so the requirements for entry level roles are just not accurate for an entry level role. Her tips for overcoming those challenges is just to build demonstrable skills because if you do happen to get that interview by demonstrating that you have enough skills to do the job that really sets you apart and helps you get the job. The next step is to network, which is so important in tech and especially in cybersecurity because if you know someone who knows someone, they can help you get through. And one of the mo most important things she find, finds rewarding about her job is she finds 
that she gets to protect people and help protect people's livelihoods and their businesses and being able to work at home in, in her own terms. So how cybersecurity contributes to other industries is starting with the financial services industries like banks. They protect financial records and ensure compliance with industry leading threat de detection and response services designed specifically for the financial services industry. With the energy and utilities industry, like the people who provide our power and electricity, um, cybersecurity can help to build programs that can defend highly complex networks architectures against that most sophisticated cyber attacks. So the government, how cybersecurity can help is they can guarantee the security of sensitive assets and data with cutting edge security capabilities at a fraction of the cost of developing in-house facilities. Yeah. Into retail and wholesale, like we're all consumers, cybersecurity can help win consumer trust and loyalty by achieving long-term compliance and ensuring the security of a customer and pay card data with manufacturing Cybersecurity can help to stay ahead of cyber threats with cost-effective security services and solutions that ensure visibility and control across all complex environments. With software and internet services, cybersecurity can help you to stay secure in the face of constant cyber attacks with services and solutions that reduce the attack surface and rapidly contain threats. The last is a healthcare industry and cybersecurity can help adopt a proactive approach that can better protect complex IT infrastructure, sensitive data, smart medical devices, and help you comply with the regu regulations. Okay. My final thoughts about cybersecurity is that it works for anyone in any stage of life. Like the person who this is about, Venetia, she is a mom and she has two kids and she's able to do this. And this job is flexible enough for her to be able to spend time with her kids and to be able to have a have a schedule that she wants and that she creates. Any questions? I just had a quick question on um, when you were talking about um, the things that she looked up that KQL queries, um, Azure and Sims um, would be helpful if you explain that in the presentation because not everybody would know what those stand for. Um, so could you just give a brief explanation? So my explanation is that she owns her own business. So KQL is like a way for her to code into it. I mean, I was looking it up, so I couldn't even quite get into it because it was confusing. But from what I gathered from her video is that she has her own lab, like cybersecurity place that she works in or that she's trying to build. So she does work for Microsoft, but she's also trying to build her own cybersecurity business apart from that. And that's her and I, what I'm assuming is that she's trying to create her own software that she can use in her own business apart from what she uses with Microsoft. Okay. And I think it's great that you found somebody who's in the business um, to get her real world experience. I think that was a great direction to start your presentation from. So kudos to you for, for uh, sort of reaching out um, and going outside of maybe normal channels for you to, to get that experience because I think that that's very helpful for people to kind of get a sense of yeah that might be something I'm interested in but what does a real day look like for somebody who works in that so good job on on that so thank you and I, I concur with the it's really good career advice for anybody going into virtually any engineering field because cybersecurity is going to be part of all of them and uh, I saw that the uh, energy and utilities was listed in one of your slides. That's my focus area. So grid cybersecurity is important to us in uh, the energy sector. So very good, excellent presentation. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mide. Um, sweet, I, I posted the link to the NICE framework in our resources. Uh, so if anyone wants to take a look, um, go for it. Um, so just wanted to do a quick time check. We are at 8.55. We have, um, uh, uh, let me see how many presentations we have. Three left. We have three left. Uh, so we might go 10 minutes over. over. Is that okay uh, with you, Greg? And yeah. Okay, awesome. If that's okay. Um, guys, and if you guys can stick around 10, 15 minutes more, that'll be great. Uh, so next up, um, is uh, 
uh, Kiera uh, go for it and the your topics is coding with Python the powerhouse of cybersecurity um, good morning everyone good morning everyone good morning um, and uh, Kiera loves to do uh, play walk, volleyball, does some track and field. Uh, she loves to ride her bike uh, and listen to music. She is familiar with music and uh, she has used Autodesk and Inventor uh, quite a lot. Uh, she is familiar with Arduino as well. Uh, and then she's learned a little bit of Python earlier. So take it away, Kira. Everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So you can see their presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, my presentation is Coding with Python, the power, the powerhouse of cybersecurity. And right here is the Python logo. So this is um, the Python website, it's python.org. And I just want to show you, and then the next slide I'm going to be explaining what Python is, but just to just a bit, it's a programming website and it program, you can program websites and uh, data analysis, and a bunch of different things. But I'll go more in depth in the next slide. So what is Python and how does Python work? So Python is an interpreted, object-oriented, high-level programming with data semantics. Its data structure is combined with dynamic typing and binding, make it useful for scripting or glue language to connect other different components together. And um, if you guys don't know what scripting is, um, a Python script is a collection of commands and a file design to be executed like a program. The file can be a course contain that contains like functions um, and import various modules. Um, but the idea is that, that all of them can come together to perform a, a specific task. And um, so Python supports modules and packages, which encourage, sorry, I cannot see my screen. Which encourage, uh, which encourage program modularity and a code reuse. And a module is just basically all of those like coding and programs um, combined into one. So in cybersecurity, Python scripts um, to automate tasks such as implementing and uh, penetration testing. A large number of cybersecurity applications and tools are based out out of and heavily rely on Python, which means they can be customized according to an individual's needs and requirements. And to use Python, it is completely free. All you have to do is go to the website from the previous slide and download it. And Python already will start you off with um, basics and it will work you work all the way down to the most advanced. So the importance of Python in cybersecurity. In cybersecurity, Python is used to automate processes, write scripts, customize tools, and orchestrate security response operations. As an entry um, cybersecurity professional, or really in any job, um, for me specifically, um, I am going to be doing electrical engineering at NCAT, so I already have um, to learn how to use Python um, when I get to school. Um, it is helpful to know the basics of Python because it's... Um, it has the ability to write scripts and you can command things that you need for a specific task. And writing and developing scripts becomes easy as it supports minimal codes and the use of um, extensive libraries. And I have something else to say, sorry. And um, if you guys don't know where libraries are, a Python library is a collection of related modules and it contains bundles of code that can be used repeatedly in different programs. Okay, so this is a quick video. I'm not gonna show it because it's literally four minutes long. So, but if you guys want to, you can look at it later. <laughs> no, it's not working. Okay. Awesome. Um, so Python used during cybersecurity chats. There are a few Python libraries and frameworks that cybersecurity experts rely on when they're, they are under a cybersecurity attack. So PLIST, I hope I'm saying that right, can be used to list processes and identify when certain processes start and how they end. PIS tree is used to analyze what processes are running, which with the help of a tree architecture. PIS can helps to uncover terminated processes which have already stopped. PIS view gives a comprehensive view of processes, their locations, where they are present and, and in which and what particular locations in your operating system. And GRR, um, Google Rapid Response, is an incident response framework based out of Python. 
And um, SOAR, which is in the um, orange, security orchestration response helps in automating, I'm sorry, I cannot see my screen. Oh, helps in automating security tasks and is used at the time of incident response when, when they analyze various different alerts. So an example of this would be a security alert has been generated and Python labels or uses SOAR. Um, so cybersecurity experts use SOAR and they can perform initial analysis to determine the nature of the alert and type of incident and how to respond to it. With the help of Python, cybersecurity experts can create playbooks, which can automate analysis for analyzing different types of cybersecurity attacks. So right here is just the basics of Python. Um, when you start off, um, they will start you off with uh, syntax. Um, next, we go on to variables, strings, numbers, booleans, constants, com comments, and type versions. So if you, anyone's interested, this is what the first section you would do. And even knowing this will get you ahead of most people who um, want to get into coding or um, will get you ahead of people already in cybersecurity. So right here is a, a practice website that I uh, played around with um, for the past couple of days. And um, it just shows you what you can code. So um, example, the example is the parameter weekend is true if it is a weekday and the parameter vacation is true if we are on vacation. We sleep in if it's not a weekday and we're on vacation. Return true if we sleep in. So below is the code that I did. So I said, oops, sorry. So I did, um, if not a weekday or vacation, return true. And if it's anything else, then it will be false. And um, below right here um, in the uh, dark blue are other websites you can use to practice Python and other stuff. But this one specifically is codingbat.com. And this is my bibliography. Great. Thank you Thank for listening. You. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. Of course. Is is um, Python used not only to de uh, detect attacks but also to counter attacks? Yes. I... When I was yeah, I'm pretty sure. All right. Awesome. Any comments, Kate? Yeah, I was just gonna say one. Um, it was a great presentation. I thought it was very clear that you've done some research, you've done some homework, you've shown your examples of what that coding looked like, which for when we're just talking about this kind of coding in general, and we're saying things like syntax and variables and libraries, you know, as a concept um, for people who haven't done it before, that can be very hard to visualize. So I was glad that you went in, did a very simple program that you showed what that looked like a little bit. Um, obviously, this isn't an in-depth class, so but just giving that little bit is very helpful. The only um, thing I would suggest is just to make sure from a graphic design standpoint that the font colors that you're using are very easy to read. I mean, even you had some problems reading your own font there. So I would be careful of that for future presentations, but overall well organized and it was clear that you did some work on it. So good job. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm red, green, colorblind. So that red lettering on the green background was really hard for me to see. <laughs> And I have vision issues as well. So I had a very <laughs> hard time reading it without being like right up into the camera face, which I didn't want to scare all of you on. So <laughs> you want to be cautious of your audience in that respect. <laughs> a great, yeah. Awesome. No worries. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jacoby. Um, if you're around. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, great. Um, so Jacoby likes to uh, hang out with friends and play video games. Uh, he is familiar uh, with computers, uh, but uh, it has not used command line. Uh, and Jacoby, your topic today is protecting your online gaming account. Uh, so uh, take it away. Am I sharing my screen? Yep. Okay, so what I'm presenting today is protecting your online gaming account and how I like to keep it safe. My agenda is the definition of online gaming, a brief history of the game, of a game that's been out for many years, an online game that's been out for many years, and how to protect yourself from an account from hackers and my summary. So online gaming is is games that are either part 
partially or primarily played through the internet or any other computer network avail availability. Online games can be played any number on any number of devices from video game consoles such as PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo Switches, PC, laptops, and also on mobile phones. And the game I'll be talking about is called World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft is a is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, MMORPG. That's what that's the acronyms for it. It is released in it was released in 2004 by Blake Blizzard Entertainment with 4.8 million players. It's set in a world a Warcraft fantasy universe. World of Warcraft takes place within the world of Azeroth, approximately four years after the event of the previous game in the series World of Warcraft Three: The Frozen Throne. So, World of Warcraft and Warcraft are two different games. Warcraft came out first in like 1994. Then it just launched in series. Then World of Warcraft became the online RPG game that we know today. And it came out in 2004 and it's still active today. <laughs> and how to protect your account in World of Warcraft. So Blizzard Entertainment is the ones that own World of Warcraft. They have a website that I listed below that gives you ways to protect yourself and gives you insights on how hackers will try to uh, get into your account, such as uh, websites, browsing usernames and passwords, malicious website phishing, and account sharing. And my summary, like there's our th there are thousands of people that are hacking online gaming, such as myself. I recently got hacked and there are many uh, hackers that can do it. Uh, they try websites, emails, chat, and SMS, that's text messages. And, Bl and Blizzard Entertainment is a huge company within the online community, so it's very well known. So they came out with their own website to give you info on hackers and how they would try to uh, get into your account or try to uh, pressure you or get you to uh, hand over your information. Awesome. Thank you, Jacoby. Uh, Dr. Monty, Kate, any questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, what are the risks of being hacked in an online game versus um, other types of places where you can get hacked? Is there sensitive information in your account in there? Is that the risk that they get email addresses or do you have financial stuff in there? That would be something I would have liked to have seen in the presentation is what is the consequence of having your account hacked in an online game? Yes, uh, in an online game, if you get hacked, yes, you they will take your account, delete everything that you work for. And also they could get your email, your phone number and your finances. So like on a console game, like, like me, I have my card number on there so I can buy any online thing that I need. So there's a way they can get into that as well. Cause pretty much they can hack your whole PC or laptop, whatever you play on. So, so is that something that they could um, then use for doing additional work like ransomware? They have your email address now. Now they might try yes. to get to your regular computer. OK, yes. yeah. something I would have liked to have seen just uh, brought up a little bit more in the presentation. So but good job. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. What would be an example of a way a hacker would get would hack get your information? Um. Same thing. Uh, uh, um, a lot of common ways is account sharing. So somebody can say that they're your friend and they'd be like, can I borrow, like, can I, it's something called game sharing. So they can get your account. So they basically have your email and your password to your console PC and they can pretty much take everything that you work for. Like me personally, uh, when the PlayStation like four, three came out, I game share with somebody. He took all my games from me, deleted everything that I had. So I pretty much had to start over from scratch. And if I recall right, with the those kind of games, you're playing with other people, so they could steal your identity, and other people would think they were playing with you, yeah. but they'd really be playing with somebody else. So that puts them at risk as well. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, spelling that out in the presentation would I, I think would have um, built that up a, a lot. But clearly, you have a passion for it, which is which is great. And I, I I've had friends who have played it for years, so I'm I'm very familiar with the game. So. It's a good thing. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much. Next up in today's last presenter uh, is uh, Nimuniza. Uh, you're up next. Uh, so feel free to start sharing. Um, and the topic is uh, three key ways uh, Python introduces you to cybersecurity. Uh, and Naya, uh, she, uh, she loves to read. Uh, she likes uh, romance and fantasy. Uh, she also loves uh, Star Trek, Game of Thrones. Uh, she's familiar enough with computers, um, but uh, not into command line or anything um, deep like programming. All right, take it away now. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, hello. So I am doing the three key ways of Python and um, Python and how uh, Python introduces you to cybersecurity. And so those three key ways are just some things that like you can do in Python. Um, it's just a brief, like very brief summary. Um, so Python has a wide, a, a wide range of functionalities that makes coding more straightforward for cybersecurity specialists and learners. And I put a diagram um, or a chart, a line chart on the side um, of the growth of Python over the years because I when, um, when my, I took robotics um, and seen in my senior year of high school, and we didn't get into depth with Python, but he was it was one of the first coding um languages that he introduced us to as well as microbit so my first topic is how um debugging is easier and my second one will be useful to um useful to how how it is useful to create security tools and ability for mal malware analysis so how debugging is easier. So what is debugging? So when a code is not working right, the, the, the developer inspects and executes, otherwise known as debugs, the um, code to determine where an application is not matching how the code should be working. So however, it also is, is also a performance to make the code more efficient. With Python's um, readability, debugging is much easier and more straightforward. So Debugging tools used in Python. So PDB, which is built into, into the Python library and is one of the first tools that developers came up, um, come across to um, debug programs. And for use, and for those who don't have a full bug debugger, they can use IPython. So security tools and ethics and ethical hacking. Python can create software that can be used to hack into websites and other systems. The current exploit software are written in Python, make, Python making the introduce, introduction to it and cybersecurity is easier. Yeah. All right, I'm calling my call, can you there? Here is one of the many open source Python security tools. So Bandit is one of them. There is many more, and that, that is in my sources on my last slide. Um, so this tool for Python code is made to find security issues by processing the, um, the file and then building a syntax tree from the file, then uses analyzing tools against the code of the syntax tree to um, generate a, re a report. So my top, my last topic is malware analysis. So what is malware analysis? It studies malware to determine the functionality origin and how much impact it made on the code. Python malware analysis. So there are many tools that are used for Python-based malware analysis. So those such tools are said to be the best introduction to understanding Python. However, um, sometimes those existing tools won't meet your desired needs for the code. So you have to result into um, customizing your own code by relying on the Python library. So some tools that I discovered was um, P, um, um, P Y E W and analyze P E and um, P E P E um, scanner. So therefore, so what I've learned is that there are more ways more ways that Python could be used for cybersecurity, 
and hope for better functionality in cybersecurity profession professionals. However, for new learners of cybersecurity, Python, Python's readable code and open source make up Makeup is one of the easiest introductions to learning cybersecurity and coding at the same time through the use of different cybersecurity tools. So for me, it um, this was this whole entire presentation to me was very new because my my teacher then didn't really introduce us to cybersecurity with Python. But I know um, Mr. Um, Mr. V is um, has a, a a course on it. But for um, when I was researching this, everything that popped up was like, okay, this is very new. I don't know what it is, but um, I'm willing to learn it. But um, we coded more with robots. So that is it for my presentation. Thank you. Did, did you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also confused a little bit, but is the debugging something that's used for cybersecurity or just for debugging of one software that's written so, in python so um what i what i saw that is um when i was researching is that like i guess it just it is just deep debugging because it didn't really say much about cybersecurity but um i guess it's just to take um, bad code out of your um code mm -hmm. or to make it more efficient so okay. all right thank you and can you describe, you'd mentioned Python versus IPython. Um, what is the difference on there? Can you describe that? Is that like an online tool? It's like a light Python light or something? I think you may be muted. I pop in this right here. Okay, okay. so. Go ahead. Okay, so this was um this was a what like a there's a link to it on the one of the sources I did, and I didn't didn't go into that link, but I think it's one of the uh, like a a link say so you can code more, um use used to code, so um so it's one of the deb debugging tools I believe so. Okay, um one I want to say good use of graphics on using the chart early on. Um, I think that was a very effective use of that chart to show the growth of Python, and then also showing where the other um, languages are being used. Uh, graphics are, you know, not just a way to make a presentation pretty. You want to make sure that it has an impact to it. So good job on that. And I like the way you broke down the malware. Um, and I like the fact that you sort of have a source list at the back that you can refer to. So, so good job on that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we are a little over. Uh, so apologies for that. I uh, will uh, wrap up today. Tomorrow, uh, we probably have about four to five presentations. So we will have a little bit more time in tomorrow's hour uh, to kind of summarize. And, and also I'll, I'll touch base with uh, Greg, you and Kate. Um, but tomorrow uh, we will kind of give you more pointers on what next to do as well. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time and thank you for putting in so much hard work in the presentation. So I'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 uh, Pacific time, 11 your time. Uh, so thank you again for all the time. Oh, thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs>